I'm, I'm thrilled next to, to welcome um, Dr. Robert Gabay. Um, Dr. Robert uh, Gabay, Dr. Gabay joins us as, as the um, ADA's Chief Science and Medical Officer. Um, and he leads the ADA's efforts to, to um, drive discovery and um, at, within the world of diabetes research, care, and prevention. Previously, Dr. Gabay served as the Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President at Jocelyn Diabetes Center, as well as Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. At Jocelyn, he oversaw the care of over 25,000 patients with diabetes, as well as the education and care programs that Jocelyn delivers nationally and internationally. We are so excited to have Dr. Gobey presenting today on the future of diabetes. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. So great to have you uh, joining us. And I echo Dr. Weinstock's comments that uh, really uh, the future of diabetes is you. Uh, it's not old people like me. It's going to be what you do in your lifetimes. And this program is one way that the American Diabetes Association is reaching out to you to encourage you, to guide you, to provide mentorship, uh, and we welcome your feedback on how we could best do that. So I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I, I think we're going to have a little dialogue, yeah. right, uh, to make this a little more interesting. And can we throw out questions to them to sort of... Uh, we sure can. This is interactive. And, and again, this is a great way for us to get to know each other and, and for the fellows to get to know each other. So do you want to start with a question and, and, and sort of wake everyone up this afternoon if, if they aren't already? Yeah, let's do that. Let's see if people are tuning in, if they're paying attention or are you checking your emails? And uh, so I, I will flip the question that I'm supposed to answer to all of you. And I will ask you, you know, what do you think is going to be the big change in diabetes in the future? Where, where do you think it's headed? Uh, and then we'll have some dialogue around that as well. But curious, throw in, um, uh, throw in your comments and let's see what you think. And feel free to raise your hands as, as, as our producer Gil mentions, um, unmute yourselves. Um, and if you'd like, you know, certainly you can use the chat if, if you don't wanna um, ask out loud. So Chelsea, thank you for mentioning uh, your, your interest in your, your enthusiasm about advances in diabetes technology, a glucagon system for type one diabetes. Um, and, and then with, with the closed loops, this is from Molly as well, closed loop by hormonal um, with the glucagon and insulin. Um, everyone is so enthusiastic. I, I, we're, we're just uh, keeping up tepalizumab, new oral medications, more about closed loops. Um, and again, Again, more about prevention of the progression of type 1 diabetes. So, Dr. Gabe, what are your thoughts? So we are really at an exciting frontier for our fellows. They have a lot of new things to, to lean on. Oral we, uh, insulin. Yes, I, I agree. I, I think this is uh, probably the most exciting time. Uh, you know, I've been in the diabetes world all my career. Um, and Wow, what we're about to see, uh, you know, and already have seen some glimpses of, as as folks have mentioned, about moving towards automated insulin delivery. Uh, a decade ago, ah, nobody really thought that would happen. Two decades ago, they thought it was going to happen in five years. Um, so things keep changing. Uh, I think that is is certainly going to be part of it. Um, the the big question there, and and we'll we'll get into this is uh, something we're really concerned about it at, at ADA and that's equity. So, yep, these things become available, but who gets them? Does everybody get them? Mm, that certainly hasn't been the way it's been so far. And so um, I, th I think that's going to be hopefully an area of focus uh, nationally, uh, internationally. Um, and certainly it's a big focus uh, from all of us at ADA. I'm really glad to hear you mention that. Just as you said, we it's great when we have all these discoveries, but 
but enhancing access to them. And, and one of our, our fellow colleagues here talked about also cost of, of uh, medications. And so can you tell us a little bit about what the ADA, what efforts are already in place or planned for, to, for, for addressing some of these disparities? Yeah, very much so. So uh, one of the things, you know, is as we look at um, what the pandemic has uh, taught us, uh, uh, it has in, you know, a number of things, but one of the things is it's been a magnifier. Uh, and, and what it is magnified is some long-term problems that we've had. We've seen the, you know, the, the demonstration of the problems with public health system and how that needs to be invested in. But another big one has been uh, the incredible health disparities that exist in this country, uh, and it's time to do something about it. And we at ADA have really taken a strong stand here. Uh, I encourage everybody to go to our website. There is a, a Health Equity Now. Um, there is a compelling video that talks about why health equity we all know the huge disparities that exist in diabetes, but if we solve it for diabetes, we will largely be mapping out what happens for other diseases as well. And I think that's really the exciting opportunity. The other thing you'll find there is a um, health equity bill of rights. Uh, and that, that's really a credo that we are looking to follow. Uh, and it has things like everybody should have access to healthy food. Everybody should have access to the technology that will allow them to manage their diabetes effectively. Everybody should have access to the medications they need to take good care of their diabetes. And so that's, all of those are areas we're really leaning in strongly and advocating for in a lot of different ways. That's really fantastic. I think one of the things we struggle with is the burden of diabetes in our population. Um, but this is where we can turn that, that challenge into being because of the burden and because of the ways that we can address these disparities, we can really be a model for, for other, other chronic diseases and conditions as well. That, that, that's fantastic. And, and for our fellows um, interested, there are all sorts of interest groups, as we mentioned, there are, uh, you know, in, in advocacy and disparities, and, and you can certainly get involved in those even at the fellow stage. And, and we can share some of those, those resources with you. You mentioned- and in fact uh, I'll just I'll just put a quick plug and say, you know, um, for those of you that, you know, I, I remember when I was a fellow and I was a little bit shy to sort of engage in these kinds of things. Um, the interest groups are a wonderful forum where you can throw out a question. You could start by just following it. And, and there are, you know, regular feeds of information from the, you know, the famous people that, whose papers you read to fellows. Um, and, and you can all have a voice and be part of a community. Uh, this is something we've done over the last few years. And I really encourage you as a, as a way to start uh, dipping your toe into the world because, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are just this wonderful collective group of people that are all committed to the same kinds of things. And it's through connections with each other that uh, your careers will blossom. Um, you know, who knows who you will connect with. They may give you a job if you're looking for a job. Any of those kinds of things are possible. So I very much encourage engaging in the interest groups, finding the ones that, you know, are, are you know, you're an islet cell biology person. Yep, we've got one for that. Uh, you, you name it, we got it. Thank you so much. And, and that's a really great point. And what's, you know, as we transition into discussing the pandemic a little and COVID-19, I, I remember the, the breadth of, of knowledge and there was a, a COVID-19 group and, and we were getting really nice, um, you know, in for very up-to-date volumes of information. And I have to say, it was exciting to see that fellows were driving a lot of this, you know, being on the wards and seeing those patients. And so tell us a little bit about your experience um, overseeing a lot of, of what was going on in our challenges with the pandemic. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, we, we all and and all of you really were on the front lines uh, uh, much more than than some of us. And um, you have seen a transformation in healthcare in, in a way that, you know, really unprecedented, I, I would say, in any other period of time. So 
I, I, you know, one of the things that, you know, when I reflect back on the pandemic, um, it has been an accelerant for change. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, for those of you that were involved in clinical care and research, um, when it hit, wow, did we change and did we change quickly? Like we all talked about telemedicine for how long, you know, it's been, it's been a decade or more. Uh, Dr. Weinstock did groundbreaking work even before that on telemedicine, but it was never prime time. And then in the matter of two weeks, uh, I can tell you, I was, I was still at Jocelyn at the time when, when things first really started happening in, in, in March and a year and a half ago. Um, and we, I, I'll, I'll never forget, I, I was in my office, um, there was a knock on the door, uh, and I opened the door and we found out that we had our first staff member uh, test positive for COVID. And that's when we knew, holy crap, we need to like, like lock this place down. We need to do all of our care remotely. And in the matter of, and you know, this is not unique to Jocelyn, all of you have seen this, in the matter of two weeks, we did what normally would have taken two months, I mean, two years mm -hmm. to retool everything. How are people going to send their blood glucoses? What are the educators going to do? How do the facts, you know, everything, all the details. So, it, you know, in, in an interesting way, it showed us that um, if we really want to and have to change, healthcare could change pretty darn quick. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot that we've been able to do um, with, with the ability to upload uh, continuous glucose and insulin pump data, for example. And, and certainly this has improved access in many ways for, for a lot of our patients. I, I always found it interesting too that more family members would engage because you know now they're at home and they're available. They don't have to, to, to worry about coming in. And so tell us how, how ADA envisions telemedicine working in parallel with in-person visits um, you know, where we do need to see the patient and examine them as well sometimes. Yeah, I, I think they're complementary. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the things that we, we advocated very early on in the pandemic uh, to uh, A, make sure that telemedicine was reimbursed, but then a few months ago, pushing to make sure that they didn't roll that back. Mm -hmm. And we're, we'll continue to fight to maintain access to telemedicine because we, we think it's here to stay. Um, it's not a replacement, that's not the goal, but for exactly the reasons you said, it, it allows greater access, it might allow more frequent touches. Uh, I think you've all probably had the experience of a patient not sure what medicine they're on and literally going and pulling out the bottle and checking, you know, Whereas in the old days, we would just like, well, call me and tell me what it is, you know, and that never quite worked out. So I, I, I really think it is, it is here to stay. Um, the other interesting uh, piece that has uh, accelerated is uh, digital health. So as you all know, there are many companies out there that are offering a variety of services to patients Again, not a replacement for what we all do, um, but you know, honestly, where where they do a good job and we historically have not is the sort of between visit care. Mm -hmm. Like we see them and we do, a, you know, you all do a great job, but then you don't see them until whenever they next come. And in between, eh, you know, if they reach out to you, yes, but we tend not to reach out to them. Uh, and so I, I do think, you know, it's. It, it's building this ecosystem that, that we now realize telemedicine is a critical part of. Digital health will increasingly be a part of the ability to transmit data, as you said, technology, glucose uploads, all of that um, is all part of the answer. And, and I think we'll be here to stay and it'll be part of the way you all practice uh, uh, diabetes care. That's a, it's a really optimistic vision. I think, um, you know, the, the image that I was thinking of is, is, you know, this has happened to me countless times, and I'm sure many of you, where you prescribe a patient, it's not covered, and they wait three months until your, their, your next visit with them, and they haven't, nothing has changed. And so having this sort of bridge and this, this care network, I think will, will really help us. 
let's transition a little more to, to the roles of, of discovery in, in translational and basic research. And, um, you know, some of our fellows here are interested in precision medicine. And so can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about that? Yes. Uh, so, you know, uh, an area over the last three or four years that the ADA has really been leaning into is this concept of precision medicine and diabetes. And in fact, we had some of you may have participated a few months ago in a global meeting uh, with thousands of pe people. Uh, and again, this is the beauty of being able to do things virtually uh, around precision medicine. And the idea being, you know, we have uh, uh, unprecedented ability to gather and analyze big data whether that is genomic uh, data, metabolomics, uh, or behavioral information from our phones, uh, from our, uh, you know, and again, their privacy issues, I understand all of that. Um, but imagine the ability to have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, uh, and really know, for example, uh, uh, for some of the folks that are probably involved in some of this research, you know, we talk about type two diabetes as one disease, but we know it's not one disease. There are many different pathophysiologies and we just sort of do the same treatment, right? Uh, cause we can't really figure out is, is this more an insulin secretory issue? Is this more an insulin resistance issue? Is it a gut issue? You know, where, where are the lesions, but that is within reach. Um, you know, the, the technology now is, has allowed us to answer those kinds of questions. And, that, and that's really the, the work that we're excited about around precision medicine. So stay tuned, uh, you know, probably later this year for potential funding opportunities in that area for research, because we, we do think this is an important area for ADA to invest in. That's great. Thank you. That's it's it's. Um, it an exciting uh, road to look ahead to. Um, we have a lot of pediatric colleagues as well here, fellows. And, and uh, you know, we know about the disheartening rates of type two diabetes and obesity in, in children. Um, and, and they're interested in, in discoveries for children. What, what is the ADA, uh, you know, pediatric um, d discovery pathway right now? So there, there are a number of things. Uh, first, I'll, I'll, I'll just say on the, on the, type one side, you know, when we think about the future of diabetes, uh, uh, you know, medications like teplizumab uh, being close to FDA approval. And we, we you know, provided uh, FDA commentary on that because we do believe that, you know, there's a lot to be figured out. Uh, but uh, that said, we are really on the cusp of, of being able to, at a minimum, delay uh, the development of type one diabetes. And that again is something that, you know, for those of us that have been in the field and following trial net for 20 plus years, this is a historic moment um, in, 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 in the world of type one diabetes. Um, on, the, on the type two side, I think, you know, we're really uh, in terms of prevention in children in particular, I think we're really at the point of needed discovery and research, because we're not quite sure how to do that. We know the DPP for adults, um, but we're not quite sure the best way to do that uh, uh, for children. We, we know that um, it has to be a family sort of thing. Um, and so uh, this is an area we also are interested in investing in research to try to figure out. Uh, and and let, me, let me say that the way that ADA supports research um, is a few different ways. One is direct dollars that you know we may offer through the, the funding that we're able to solicit in terms of funding research. But another big area uh, is advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have people on Capitol Hill that are literally knocking on the doors of uh, Congress folks and advocating for the importance of uh, research in, in many of these areas. And the good news is that the climate has been quite good for, uh, for that. And we, we feel uh, actually quite 
good about having some some good increases in funding, which I think will really make a big difference. Absolutely. And, and adding to that networking as well, as, as you mentioned to earlier, um, from, from the interest groups and, and during the scientific sessions, um, you know, we've, we've got many other questions we could ask you, but I, I want to give you a chance. You've, you've been telling us a lot. So, so do you have another question for our fellows? Oh, yeah. So I, I, I do. Um, you know, I, I'm curious on... Um, a scale of one to 10, maybe. Um, how optimistic are you? Like where, you know, I, I, I'm trying to imagine what you are in your shoes. You've, you, you went through fellowship uh, or early career stuff during a pandemic. We're, we're hopefully coming to the other side. So, so how optimistic are you about the progress in diabetes and you know, the, the, the next five to 10 years on a scale of one to 10? Uh, I think that would be fun. That is a, that's a really good question. Um, and, and you all can respond in the chat. Perfect. Thank you, Gil. Um, you know, listening to, to, to you and Dr. Weinstock, it is so optimistic. And, and we know that that's what the ADA is here for. Um, so, so good. I think that's being projected. But it's okay. We Even we can acknowledge that on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, there's a lot of challenges we face with diabetes. And you know, as a program director, I like to prepare my fellows to, to know that the hard things too. And so yes. I love that you're so, um, you're so um, optimistic, but Amanda, you mentioned something about access to diagnosis. Um, can you, can you clarify a little bit more? Um, you mean, just, do you mean access to, to therapies or um, uh, you feel free to type it in the chat? Um Telehealth is, is an exciting thing. So um, we've got a lot of in, young, enthusiastic fellows here. Great. Can I throw, can I throw a follow-up question? Um, so so you're, you're generally optimistic about, uh, uh, your, uh, uh, about the future of diabetes. How about your career? What, uh, you know, how do the job prospects do to you, look to you as you're all, um, many of you at that stage? Yeah, what, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm curious because this is helpful feedback for us because we really are, are invested in your success and that, you know, largely is why we do this program, but I want to get a sense from your end. And maybe as a, as a sort of compliment to that, you know, what to, sort of career path, just so we can get to know yes. you a little better, better um, private practice, academic, uh, full clinical, some research, um, or all research, of course. And Amanda, yes, that that's a it's a very thank you for clarifying. Um, you know, there are especially in, you know in certain areas, certain regions, especially, we have patients who have very limited access to to chronic disease care, and and so, you know, I, I can definitely see where if you're in one of those areas as, as you are, you know, that would would be something that 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 really we we need to to work on, and and that's where things like telehealth may may come in as as we're we're waiting, Doctor. I don't know if you have any comments on. That. Well, I, I agree. I think telehealth is uh, is one uh, effective way to address that. I I also think our roles uh, will include more of uh, helping the rest of the healthcare team to provide for people. So, you know, for better or worse, there there are just not enough of us as endocrinologists to be able to. to address the number of people with diabetes. And so the answer, even if you doubled the number and, you know, right now to be, you know, non-optimistic, there aren't enough applicants to double the numbers, right? Like we wouldn't fill the match if, if we double the number of slots, not that we could do that. Um, so, so really the answer is how can we, with our specialized knowledge, leverage that across a population? We don't need to take care of all of them. Uh, we'll take care of some of them, um, but how can we help our colleagues do a better job? Uh, and I, I think that's part of the answer, and even more so in underserved areas where, you know, yes, telemedicine will give them access, but they're, you know, if you do the math of the number of people like us that there are, uh, and the number of people uh, with diabetes, and you say we work. 24 hours a day, 
Um, seven days a week, uh, you know, we, we still can't fill the gap. So it, it's going to involve our colleagues and this, this idea team-based care. But we, we have this special knowledge and ability uh, mm-hmm. and we need to leverage that and be rewarded, mm-hmm. to be fair, for leveraging that across the population. Absolutely. And, and um, Almira and Reem, you, you know, excellent points, educating residents and students in the community. Um, the ADA actually has a wonderful program um, for primary care providers and, and the standards of care. A lot of our primary care colleagues refer to that as well. And so you it can be an ambassador for, for that by, by knowing those guidelines, knowing that they come out, you can really kind of help your colleagues know where to turn. Um, uh, of course, in addition to to working with you. Um, in, the, in the side chat, please uh, encourage you to ask any questions for Dr. Gabay. Um, in the meantime, um, while we're waiting for some questions, what, is there any specific career advice you know um, you, ha- you have for, for our group? Wow. Well, um, you know, I, uh, it's, you know, we, we, have a, we have a mixed group here, so I might, I might sort of break this down a little bit. You know, on the on the clinical side, um, you know, for better or worse, the world is your oyster. You know, the, the everybody needs an endocrinologist, uh, and so pick what's best. You, you're 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 a little, little bit in the driver's seat there, and and so you know, there are obviously a lot of uh, uh, family and other considerations and geography, um, but. Uh, Feel free to negotiate a little bit, and and I know there are sessions in Focus on Fellows that'll that'll arm you a little bit better. Um, you know, uh, on the on the research side, uh, you know, I, I think it, you know as as you all know, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, I think uh, uh, mentorship is critically important. If and and that's true in the clinical side as well. Identifying good mentors whether they are the person you're working for, sure, um, but people that you don't work for, even more valuable in a sense, uh, because, you know, they, they don't have any skin in the game. Uh, uh, and they, they have, you know, identifying those mentors. And, and, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's really across everything. Um, and, and what I think makes a good mentor is somebody, you know, knowledgeable, uh, reasonable, and that they clearly have your best interest. So it doesn't mean that they're always going to cheer you on and agree with you. They may disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you know that they have your best interest in mind and there's no agenda, then that, uh, you know, uh, I've been fortunate to have just incredible mentors and that, you know, is, and, and I think if you speak to, you know, all of the the senior people out there, everybody's got that kind of story. It it really is about mentorship, and and the beauty is you'll someday get a chance to pay back uh, to the next generation. You know, and that's why we do what we do. Dr. Weinstock said that at the beginning. It's one of the most enjoyable things we do uh, because we can never pay back the people that did for us. We do for you. Well, well, I, I, I can't um, echo that enough, and I appreciate that, and I've seen your mentorship, and, and as you mentioned, it, one thing I want to remind our fellows is just be, be your own advocate. Don't be, don't be shy about approaching um, people. You know, if, if somebody's busy, they'll, they'll, they, they'll tell you no, and, and that's it, but for, for most of us, it's, it's really a pleasure, and we gain a lot out of it, too, so it's really, you, you know, don't, even, even the, the sort of big people that you can't approach approach. Um, you know, and the other thing is sometimes if they, they can't mentor you directly, they'll know someone else who can. And so please be your own advocate. Um, you know, we are very, have- very true. I think that uh, I'll put a pin in that. Yeah. Be, be a little pushy. It's okay. Yeah. You, you know, it, it, no one's going to do it for you and it's okay. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Get a little out of your comfort zone. Um, uh, it's worth it. Thank you so much. And, and so we have one minute left and, and I want to ask you in 45 seconds, 
do you have any advice about the scientific session? It's a big program, so much information. But it, but what what would how would should fellows approach it? Yeah, it 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 is the most. I mean, it's everything, right? It's mm -hmm. everything, and and so in that way, it it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, you know, I I would I would look at the program a little bit as what do you know you're interested in? And sometimes the things you know very little about can be the most rewarding uh, because you can learn something about an area you're not familiar with. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyway. Um, you know, the, one of the nice things about being virtual is it's very easy to like pop around. Uh, and so, you know, Go to a session that you may not know that much about. At least the introduction, you'll you'll learn a little bit about that field, and then you know maybe when they get deeper in and you're not interested, jump to something else. But take advantage of that wealth of information, um, and you know whether it is in the clinical arena where there'll be announcements of landmark trials that will uh, uh, be shared, as well as wonderful reviews of the science. So. Uh, you know, the interrelationship between kidney disease, heart disease, and diabetes. You've got experts just summarizing all the evidence and all of that in one session. Like, you don't have to read all those studies. I mean, not saying you shouldn't. You should read all the studies. But, you know, it, it's that kind of stuff that if you're, if you're strategic, so spend some time before the meeting to plot out what is what interests you. And, and, and again, pick some things that you, you don't know that much about because it's a great opportunity, low risk to learn about it. Thank you so much. We've covered so much. We could make a whole day out of this conversation. And I just want to share um, with the fellows that Dr. Gabe is a member of the Early Career Advisory Group and year after year um, contributes to this. And so we're so grateful for your wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm. And, and, and we look forward to to the fellows interacting with you again in the future. Thank you so much for your time today. Very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks to all of you for being part of this. And uh, I know this year uh, we won't be able to see each other in person, but you'll find that the session is very interactive. So take advantage of the chat. Say hi. I'll be on like all sorts of sessions. And I look forward to seeing you all in New Orleans next year. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.